what's becoming popular in modern theology in contemporary Christianity and literally by you and I is everyone is redefining Jesus they're defining Jesus into their own image they're trying to make him in to be who they are or what they want him to be as opposed to accepting who he is as he reveals himself to us there are the Orthodox who want to make Jesus into some kind of tally swearing Orthodox Jew and he wasn't as a matter of fact he would have been rejected by the Orthodox community outright even as he has been for centuries the Orthodox community would have nothing to do with them the scribes the Pharisees and the Sadducees as well as the Herodians were all those sects of Judaism that were very much so the same as the sects today of Judaism they were orthodox in nature they exercised a certain parameter of religious observance and they insisted upon the priesthood being the greatest manifestation of Jewish culture and religion that there was that the Torah would be above God himself better that the law continue on than for the nation to disappear in a lot of ways Judaism has defined itself by being only about the law and only about maintaining its integrity to that law now it's about tradition and maintaining that tradition at all costs irregardless of what God may say which is exactly why when you see people swearing allegiance to Israel they're failing in what God wants them to do you don't swear allegiance to a nation that's in rebellion to God you witness to that nation of what God wants for them you pray for the peace of Jerusalem you pray that they would repent from their sins because God is going to send two witnesses not for the world to understand why they're there the two witnesses are witnessing to Jerusalem and to Israel because they're in rebellion to God people forget the Jewish nation you see today is in rebellion to God it is not religious it is not seeking to find some kind of salvation as a matter of fact it rejects outright the nature of Jesus himself they will not accept the Son of God except that Jesus himself come and reveal himself as their deliverer and he will at the end of the millennium I mean at the end of the tribulation period but the point is is that the Orthodox of Christians tried to make Jesus into some kind of super Jew and he wasn't Jesus was the Son of Man he came as a suffering servant he was from a despised city as a matter of fact he would not have been accepted in common community because of where he came from and the people he associated with so you see he was a man of the people he was not a man of quote unquote orthodoxy so don't let messianic messy antics try to change Jesus for you don't you get in your imagination somehow that Jesus was some super Jew no he was just a normal Jew like every other Jew at the time just like normal people today he was a carpenter's son he happened to be living in a community that they didn't really accept his claim to being a prophet or being the son of God because they knew him and they had seen him grow up so he didn't do many miracles there because they didn't believe him period they didn't accept his ministry at all so one of the things that happens in modern culture also is this idea that they don't want Jesus to be like he really is so they try to make him into being some kind of macho gun toting violent person where Jesus was told and we are told constantly that he was mellow and gentle and he was meek and lowly and he said he would not even cause a f smoking flax to be quenched meaning that a little tiny smoking match that was gone out would not be put out by him that he was so gentle that he would not cause even a reed that was bent over to break and yet some people try to tell you that oh he took a whip and he beat people and he caused a riot in the temple and that he was a strong-armed man and that he wasn't a carpenter he was a mason he was muscles built strong and he was violent no the Bible warns against violence it always has and it always will 
The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force up until the Son of Man. But the Son of Man, at any point of time, could have said, I am, and wiped out the entire universe. He doesn't have to do anything. All he has to do is let go, and the universe ceases to exist. He holds all things together. That's the point. Don't let people redefine Jesus. The beauty of how we know the Son of Man as the Son of God is the fact that he restrained his power and became a man even though he could have called upon his Father to deliver him at any point in time and was willing to die and did die for our sake. That's not a man that goes out with a gun. That's not a man that takes up the sword. That's not a man that fights in any way. That's a man who comes back on the day that the Armageddon is in full swing and the, val and the battles are going on, and he says, peace, be still. And the entire armies of the world are annihilated. Just like he said, peace, be still, to the storms, and it immediately ceased. He didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to jump up and down and get excited. He didn't have to scream and shout. He just said, peace. And the same will be true when he comes to the Valley of Megiddo. He doesn't take up a sword. He doesn't fight. He just says a word. And the word goes forth from him like a flaming sword. And it devastates. But that's because the object of what the word goes to ceases to exist. Because as he was there in creation at the beginning, he caused things to be created. As he spoke, it came into existence. So if he speaks, it will cease to exist. Do you begin to get the picture here? Jesus is not a violent man. Jesus came that we might be saved. And the meekest among us is the reality of what God said he wants us to become like and be likened unto. Because it's no glory to be powerful, but it is to be humble. So Tozer, or not Tozer actually, but in utmost for his highest, we challenge ourselves to re-examine what Jesus has shown us at different times in our life. We choose to objectify Jesus at some point in time to say, let's just be objective for a minute. Let's try to prove to ourselves that we have an accurate picture. And then go back in and look at it. So, without asking Jesus direct sometimes, go do that. Take who you think he is and then just look throughout all of history. What made Jesus unique than any other man? Was it his violent nature? Was it his orthodoxy? Or was it the fact that he said, love your enemies? And then he did it. You see, Jesus is who he is because of what he said and what he did. And when you redefine him, you have eliminated the Son of God and the power of the cross to effectually forgive you for any sin that you've committed. You have eliminated the atoning sacrifice of the Lamb that was slain for all of our sins. Because if you redefine Jesus into an orthodox, or you redefine him into a violent man, you have made him a worldly God. And just one more of all the other gods that are in this world. But when you make him the exception to the rule, to every rule and every interpretation and philosophy that man has, then you find why Christianity is completely different than every other religion in the world because every other religion will teach you violence. They will teach you to fight for God, to have holy wars, to do the things and kill and murder and claim it's okay because it's being done in the name of God. But that's not what Jesus said. Because Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And he took authority from that moment on to change the way we related to God. Violence is gone. Jesus is still the same. We have a better way. And it's called the revelation of God himself in the form of Jesus. And he said, God is love. Love cannot murder, kill, or even eliminate, for self-defense reasons, some person. No. Because love knows that it can overcome death even. And it just laughs in the face of violence in front of it and says, whether I live or whether I die, I know where I'm going and I know where I'll be because as I have loved, so will God love me and he will take me to be with him. So murder me now or take my life. It doesn't matter to me. 
because you see, I'll always be who he wants me to be. Jesus is that personage of the very fulfillment of all that God is. And God is love. God is not violent. Love does and did eliminate the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Shivites, and all these other ites. And the reasons are multiple, which we could get into in a Bible study. But the point is, study Jesus and read his words. Don't read what you interpret. Don't read what Paul said or Peter or someone else. Just read what Jesus said. If you don't want to know what people have interpreted, and if you want to know the purity of who God is, read what Jesus said about himself. Read what the testimony of Jesus is and who he is. And don't let people interpret it for you. Always know, as a matter of fact, the reality of who God has revealed himself as to you, or else you will be misled. The Mormons do have a, a Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses have a Jesus. There are lots of Jesuses out there being interpreted by lots of false teachers, prophets, and religions. But they aren't the Son of God. The glory that excels. The Lord has sent me that thou mightst receive thy sight. Acts 9.17 When Paul received his sight, he received spiritually an insight into the person of Jesus Christ. Paul would have known all the prophecies and studied them intricately and intimately. Based upon his knowledge that is personified in the book of Hebrews, this man was extremely well versed in all applications of how the law and how God operates. And he was able to personify what Jesus had done to the Jew in the perfect tractate of the entire book of the Hebrews that he wrote to the Jews so that they would know if they were using only the intellect that this man is the Son of God. But unfortunately, rebellion doesn't use just the intellect, but it also hardens the heart. And if the heart is softened, then the Jew can read the book of Hebrews and know that Jesus is the Son of God. But you see, Paul had been where the Jew is. He had rejected the gospel message. He had seen what was being said. He had noticed what was being done. It didn't matter the miracles. He was out to stop this new sect of Judaism from even getting off the ground. So God stopped him. And God spoke to him. And he spent time alone with God to discover who this Jesus was. And he didn't go forward until he knew. But when he did, he was confident of the Jesus he portrayed, of the confidence, confident of the Jesus he revealed, and he knew of whom he spoke. Because he had conversed with Jesus and proven to himself all that fulfilled the word of God in the person of Jesus. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The whole of his life that Paul spent was preaching nothing but Jesus. No attraction was ever allowed to hold the mind and soul of Paul except for the face of Jesus himself. We have to learn to maintain an unimpaired state of character up to the last notch revealed in the vision of Jesus. For all of us, that's hard to do. It's a challenge when we want our utmost to be the revelation of Jesus and talk about him and show him and reveal him to the world when at times we fail in measuring up to the person that Jesus was. Because he was so gentle. We get angry, we get mad, we get frustrated. We are antagonized on one side. We are frustrated on another. We are tired from another aspect. We are weary from another. And yet, we see Jesus and we feel revived. We feel alive. We know that though the world passes away, as long as we can see Jesus, it's worth it today to take the time to explain to anyone and everyone the reason for the hope that lies within us, for the person that we have come to know and that we have found amazingly so, that he really is alive that he really exists and that he does speak to us not only in his word but in our devotionals and in our circumstances and in our emotions and in our intellect and in our heart and in our soul 
and in the very feelings we have as he makes us whole. But we do frustrate at times and feel that wearing down as we get older or as we do so much. And at some point in time we begin to wonder, Oh God, look at the world and what it shows about you. How can they live with that kind of Jesus? How can they live without you? Make sure you know who you're talking about before you go telling people about someone you think you know. The danger is Jesus can't say, I never knew you. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. And I would that you would never find yourself in that position. So stop what you're doing if you don't know. If you don't hear and you can't ask God, who is this man, Jesus? What has he done? Let him speak to me. Then don't portray Jesus in a wrong way. Say you don't know and let it be so until the time you do know and you're able to say with all confidence, this is Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God. The abiding characteristic of a spiritual man is the interpretation of the Lord Jesus Christ to himself and the interpretation to others of the purposes of God. Never get drawn into criticizing someone else's walk with God. Never get pulled into saying, that man is not one of us. Never get pulled into anything except what Jesus tells you to do. Because when you do that, the purposes of God are such that Jesus has said to his own disciples, don't criticize others that are in the ministry because you don't know what the Father has given to them to do. God is the one who is in control and gives to every man a portion of faith according to the direction of his own sovereignty. If he allows something to happen, it's his servant, not yours. You are called to follow Jesus. You are called to serve Jesus. You are called to walk with Jesus. Don't get into other man's service. Don't get into other churches. Don't get involved in the nitpicking, the backbiting, the gossiping, the false accusations, the false statements, the lies, the deceit, the world, the divisions, and the strife that has come into Christianity where people accept it as a norm to criticize another pastor or a teacher or an elder or a deacon. And they don't even think that the Holy Spirit is grieved by that. For how could love manifest itself in those words and actions whereby we are not unified in one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. It's not about one in the Spirit with us here and them over there. No. Because the reality is that when it comes to salvation, all of us are one. We have been saved in one body, one faith, one baptism, one redemption that Jesus has caused for us. And it took one man to do that. And that man we follow. Don't get involved in the strife. Don't be defined by these other false ideas of criticizing and saying, oh, we've been given authority to call out false prophets. We've been given authority to call out false teachers. We've been given authority to criticize and to judge. No, you haven't. You were told to follow him. Every man that I hear when I ask them straight up, every man so far to date, I have asked them directly, did Jesus tell you to do this? And they say no. They either say no by their actions or they say no by their words because the reality is, is that Jesus did not tell them to go out. They will tell me the scripture says we should judge. I'll say, fine, live by the scripture, die by the scripture. Is the scripture going to save you? Great, live it. But if the scripture is not going to save you and Jesus says to you that he doesn't know you, I think you better know him and the scripture both. Because the living part of that scripture is Jesus himself. From cover to cover, you can search it and think that you know the scriptures and that you could use it for any means that you want to in order to criticize everyone in the world. Because everything is contained in the scriptures. But tell me how God wants you to use it. Then I'll listen. Don't tell me that you have authority based upon the written word alone. Tell me God told you to. And then I'll listen. And I'll consider. And I'll pray. And I'll ask God if He did. And then I'll participate or not as He tells me to. So you see, we aren't called to criticize each other. We're called to analyze ourselves 
in light of the scripture and then talk to Jesus about it and ask him to change us and allow him to speak to us about it. Because we're serving him, not serving men. We're serving him, not serving our own image of ministry. We're serving Jesus. We're not worried about the results. We're serving the risen Lord. The one concentrated passion of the life is Jesus Christ. Whenever you meet this note in a man, you feel he is a man after God's own heart. God desires, and it's so simple to understand, that the whole world would be saved. Because he's provided the means and the opportunity whereby all men, irregardless of race, creed, color, nationality, background, heritage, or any other thing that they think they've done or ever have done, can be saved. They can be as little as it takes would be to call upon the name of the Lord. As much as it takes is to call upon the name of the Lord. All they need do is call. Because Jesus said, He that the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. I will sustain you. I will do the work. You just call upon me and I will take care of you. I will give you salvation. I will bestow upon you mercy and grace because I am the one who can. And when we call upon Jesus... That is what we cling to by our love for Him. Through His mercy and grace, He redeems us. Because to put it bluntly, no man ever said He has to. You can't tell me that God has to do something because you think that there is some kind of automatic, quote-unquote, compulsory act written in the Word of God that can't be excluded or included in whatever your theological ideology is about how you think you understand what God is. God can do anything He wants to any time He wants to. That's the point. So, by His love and mercy, He has revealed to us what He wants us to know and we can call upon Him and find mercy and grace. Because you'll find that in any other way, you won't be there. You won't make it. But by His mercy, by His loving kindness, by His grace, He will save you. He will not save you any other way. Because of the love that He has for us, He gave His Son to die for our sin. All we need to do is accept the fact that Jesus has accomplished the work and then call upon Him and develop that relationship. For if it be so that God Himself said that Jesus determines whose are his and whose isn't. If we're not his, we have no salvation. He who has the Son hath life. He who has not the Son of God hath not life. We must be found in him. So we must know him and he must know us. We must develop a relationship. Not just call and act like we're saved and by faith believe it, but call and develop a personal conversation where we grow day by day in the knowledge of Him. Never allow anything to deflect you from insight into Jesus Christ. It is a test of whether you are spiritual or not. To be unspiritual means that other things have a growing fascination for you. People get off into Jewish culture, Jewish traditions, Jewish dogmas, Jewish ideas, Jewish mysticism, and all kinds of Jewish stuff. They need to knock the stuffing out of their Christianity and get rid of the Jewish stuff. It's about the Son of God. We are all becoming sons of God. We're not becoming Jewish. We've been grafted in, but that's only by faith. You Just like you can say you're grafted into the Catholic Church. You are. You're part of that heritage that came up through the Catholic Church. The same way that you're part of that heritage that came up through Jewish roots. The stem or the stock would be Catholic. You don't like it, that's tough. Then it branches off into Protestantism. You are part of the Protestant movement, the protesting of the Catholic Church. So you are part of that protesting part. Then it branches out into all the smaller branches of evangelicals and whatever you want to call them. All of those are still part of your heritage or you have no Bible. You have no Word of God. You have no Scripture. You have no faith. You have no reality of God working through His body of believers called His bride from the moment that He rose again from the dead to today. It's our common heritage. Irregardless of whether you're proud of it, ashamed of it, or fighting about it. It is what we are. And that's what will be 
perfected when we arrive in heaven. Until then, the imperfect will exist continually in the world. But this imperfection will put on perfection, but not in this world. Not until we ascend unto our Father. Even as Jesus said, touch me not, I have yet to ascend to my Father. Likewise, we must ascend in order for God to perfect that which concerns us. And when we do, and Jesus presents us before the Father, faultless with exceeding joy, having perfected us, then we receive in ourselves that body that he's prepared for us and that place that he wants us to live. That spiritual body that's equipped for the universe and for all eternity. That this incorruption or this corruption will put on the incorruptible. And the spiritual will put on that spiritual body that is designed for us to be with Jesus all the time and with the Father and the Spirit so that we would be one together with Him. That's why it's not about Jewish. It's not about Gentilish. It's not about evangelical. It's not fundamental. It's God. Period. All in all. That's where we're going. That's where we've been. That's where we're going to become. That's why God wants us to have the right understanding of Jesus, to know Him intimately and personally, because that's who we are meant to be. Never, ever, ever let anyone take away your understanding of Jesus except Jesus Himself. When Jesus wants to crucify your picture of Himself, He'll reveal Himself to you. And it'll be a humbling experience. Because when Jesus wants to teach you something real and personal about Himself, it'll shake you to your core. Because you'll realize that as much as you thought you knew, the Son of Man. There are things that when the Son of God reveals Himself, just like Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration, when you think you know Jesus, you know nothing at all. Because He goes so much beyond all that we can comprehend or understand. Because He is the Word of God. And we think you know what that means until we arrive there. We haven't even a clue as to how to start to speak of it, much less define it, the reality of the Word of God being made manifest in the flesh. Unbelievable. It's something that science fiction even doesn't really grasp completely. Amazing to me is how people can try to bring down the Son of God into the image of what they want their Jesus to be, created after their own image. And all they're doing is putting on rose-colored glasses and acting like they know God when they've created a Jesus that even Jesus himself might reject. Be careful. Right now, it's all through Christianity. Little nuances of it. You can see the little pictures coming out. It started at one time back in history with the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus. And it kept changing over the centuries. And now we're back to it again, trying to redefine Jesus himself rather than we define ourselves by who Jesus is.